of tonight, specific talk. Let's go back. Yeah, okay. It's being on. <laughs> okay, there you go. Tonight's a lecture, which is about a religion. Therefore, don't be surprised to see conflict, compromise, confusion, and consequences. The, uh, the, the, there are other C's, but we won't go through those. The, <laughs> being sponsored by uh, the Grilly family, Richard and Susan Grilly, in honor of uh, Olga. You sit in the wrong place, Josh. Is that okay? Okay. Um, and uh, Richard is someone I, I just met very recently. Um, doesn't live in our neighborhood. He's out there in the fancy neighborhood where Bethel is. And, uh, and, and very uh, happy that he uh, decided to attend. And is a, was not only to attend, but as you see, to sponsor, participate. Quite a story. I, mean, I, I tell you the truth. I didn't know the details until 24 hours ago, and it blew me away, and I'm going to share it with you because it's a story uh, about his mother, who, in whose honor uh, tonight's uh, lecture is, is being sponsored. And, uh, I've, and I feel a certain kinship in the sense that we both share in common uh, uh, mothers who went through the war in Czechoslovakia, or let's put it this way, who lived in Czechoslovakia and survived the war. My mother survived in Czechoslovakia. His mother got out of there, which was the right thing to do. And uh, my mother's from the poor side of tracks called Slovakia. His mother from the rich side of tracks called the Czech part, which uh, because of the dissonance between the two, they got divorced a couple years ago. Czechoslovakia is no longer a country. There's the Czech Republic on the one hand, and there's Slovakia as a separate country on the other, and both sides are happy. <laughs> it's the, one of the only cases like that where both countries say, let's just go our own ways and live side by side. It's very, very interesting. And uh, uh, I'm gonna tell you a story, I'm sure, most people, if not all, uh, don't know. Uh, his mother uh, survived the war by being on a certain uh, transport. Uh, Hitler, uh, you know Czechoslovakia was a democratic country. I spoke about it here last year or wherever before that at some length. It was the only democratic country in the 1920s and 30s in Central Europe. And uh, uh, President Masaryk and Benes, these, these were great liberals, real Democrats, and friends of the Jewish people. So we're really friends of the Jewish people. Uh, as I know, as I said, my mother uh, grew up there. And then unfortunately they went down the tubes because they were betrayed by uh, England and France at the notorious Munich Pact of uh, 1938, you know, Chamberlain and all that. And uh, Hitler promised at that time he's only take over the Sudetenland, but you know what the promises are worth. And uh, in 1939, in March of 39, uh, the German army. This is before the Second World War started. Uh, Hitler simply moved the German army in and occupied all the Czech part. If you were Jewish there, as Richard's mom was, uh, you're in trouble. She was a young girl, 10, 11 years old. And uh, the, you understand what I'm saying? The Jews in the Czech Republic suffered longer than the Jews in other countries. They were under tough German occupation, under Heydrich and people like that, all the way through. It was bad news. And uh, they were really condemned to a bitter fate. And, and yet, uh, in late 38 and then in early 39, this uh, English guy, uh, this is a story exactly paralleling the Scarlet Pimpernel, if you want the truth. You remember that? Where he goes and rescues the uh, aristocrats from the guillotine the, uh, by getting together a bunch of do-gooders, as it were. It was this English guy's name was, uh, was Nicholas Winton. His parents actually were Jewish, but he was, or they had converted to Christianity beforehand. And uh, he's, he's English, born in England. And uh, he go, he, and he's, he's a bank clerk or something like that. You know, he works in a, in a bank, at stock market. He was a clerk in the stock market in London. A schnook, that's the point, with nobody. 30 years old, he wasn't a, a high official. There's a Muslim Haskell in all this. I want you to listen closely. Uh, and yet, uh, he had visited Czechoslovakia a few months earlier, and now he sees that what's happening, and he says somebody should do something about this, and he gets together with a couple of friends, all Englishmen and Englishmen, young uh, people, not Jewish, uh, just to want to do something. And they say, you know, this is a terrible situation fall upon the Jews in, uh, in this area, and what's going to happen to it? Uh, the Nazi jackboot is, 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 is all over the place. And uh, he goes to England back, and he uh, petitions the government. And he talks to the officials, and uh, when it's all over, uh, they'll agree to take in kids, 17 years old and under, 
from Czechoslovakia, Jews, of course, uh, for the duration of the war, as they put it. In other words, temporary, but they'll take them in if somebody can promise that there won't be a public charge if we can put up 50 pounds, which is $250. I don't know what that's today, but even if you say it's $2,500 or $5,000, that's not a lot of money. Um, and the uh, and, and can you do it? And he, uh, really, they do a Scarlet Pimpernel. He sets up a little uh, uh, office in a hotel in the main street in uh, Prague, and these, these other guys go around and talk to families, and somehow they hook up with British relief agencies, the Quakers and the Messes, I don't know, all, just on their own. This is not the government. This is something they just wanted to do. And they started getting uh, kids, and they connect them with families in England. Uh, at the end, 670 kids. Right, 669, 670 kids uh, in the course of the summer of 1939 in July and August. Uh, the World War II begins in September 1 and then it's over. But until September 1, uh, you can do what you can do. What's that? This is, you can, you can, you, you, it, until then, you can bring out whoever you want. And uh, as I say before, they get children, they send uh, pictures to England, and they get family, and they put them in the papers there. This guy you know, goes around and does his, the publicity work. And it's, it's amazing. It's just amazing. And um, they get 600, between 600 and 700, 700 kids. Uh, and then, of course, the war happens. On September 1, they're ready for next transport of 300 kids. The Germans close the thing because England goes to war, and you can't do it anymore. Um, and the end of the story is uh, that these kids end up in England, taken by, usually by Christian families and, uh, you know, do-gooders. Uh, people who really, uh, you know, uh, uh, put the real meaning of faith, uh, you know, where it counts. And uh, they survived the war. Uh, there are 15,000, Richard informed me of this figure, uh, 15,000 children in the Czech Republic. Hitler kills 14,000. What was the Second World War? Of the 1,000 children that survived, 670 is from this guy. And his mother is one of those 670, which is why he's here today, otherwise he wouldn't be alive. Uh, she survives the war in England, uh, eventually comes to this country, marries another Holocaust survivor from Austria, and here they are, <laughs> here they are today. This guy, uh, that's a picture of him back in 1939 with one of the children. Let's go to the next picture. That's him today, he's 102 years old. <laughs> <laughs> right? Never told anybody about it. A f about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, he, t he, start he told his wife or something like that. And all hell broke loose. He got knighted by the queen. He's, he's given a, a medal, obviously, by Czechoslovak, by Czechs, not the Slovaks, by the Czechs. <laughs> the Slovaks want to shoot him. He said, but the, uh, by the Czechs who, who, who remained democratic. Václav Havel, who recently died, was in the footsteps of Masaryk. And not only that, but go to the next picture. There's a statue of him in the Prague station. Isn't that nice? Right? And as I say before, and, and, and that leads to us tonight. Who needs fiction? And I think the Queen of England, if I remember this correctly, when she gave him a medal or what, she he knighted him probably at the age of 90 or whatever because he never told anyone about it. And she said, I'm in the presence of good. Sometimes we hear too often today, in the presence of bad. In fact, you look at the paper all the time, and you look at this world leader, and that schnook, and the other guy wants to blow up a country, and who knows what, and you're in the presence of bad. And sometimes we're in the presence of politicians. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's another thing. And, someti and sometimes we're in the presence of good. And the reason I say it's a most high skill, a few people got together. They were not prime ministers or leaders of the government. They were not officials. They didn't have money. They just decided to do a little project, what they could do at that time. Uh, it's, you know, you, you read this and, you, and, and you know, you're happy in the one hand and you're sad on the other hand because uh, if only a few other people would have done this, what can I say? But isn't it, isn't it something that this is the basis of the sponsorship tonight and the richest mom's still alive and it's all design gesund and stark as they say. She be, she live and be well and have a lot of nachas from, from the family. <laughs> but it's a, it's a moving story, you know. It's just a moving story, and I'm almost a, I'm almost afraid to move 
from the uh, sublime to the ridiculous. <laughs> because that's where we're going tonight. Because uh, tonight's talk is about uh, the Jewish state and the Jewish religion. As soon as you mention those two terms, you're talking about conflict, compromise, confusion, and unintended consequences, as I'll try to say today. Let me start with the very beginning by saying, as we all know, Israel is a secular state, but it bankrolls all the Haredi institutions on an unimagined scale, as current pundits ruefully note. True? Uh, you have a government of people who have no time for religion and are pretty anti, and yet, uh, and that's a fact, and yet, uh, all the yeshivas of, uh, in, in, uh, have government funding. <laughs> the Kolels, Israel government funding, the most isolationist and anti-Zionist uh, people in Israel get, get, get paycheck from the government, as we know. So how'd that happen? <laughs> right? How'd that happen? Is this what Ben-Gurion intended when they founded the state of Israel? <laughs> right? uh, we're going to see about that. Uh, remember, compromise, confusion, unintended consequences. But consider, now that we have the hindsight of 60 years, the Hakamana Medina, the beginning of the State of Israel uh, in 1948, as I'm going to try to show you tonight, is actually the beginning of a new era for the Frum, <laughs> for the religious. Uh, that's what 60 years of hindsight indicates to us today. Their fortunes changed radically on May 14th, 1948, even though it's not exactly what all the founders intended. It's also in a way that nobody intended, 19, May 14, 1948, is the beginning of the decline of dynamic secular cultural Zionism, which again is not what anybody intended, but nevertheless happened. To understand all this, we have to go back to the onset of modernity real, quicky, real quickly, and as I did last week, the, uh, yeah, all right, somebody spelled that wrong. Okay, the, uh, there are a bunch of mathematicians in the audience. The, you have to go back to the onset of modernity and the cracking of the consensus, because this was the consensus, as I tried to uh, explain last time. Uh, and, and, and listen closely to what I'm going to say. You know what this means? You know what this means? And you know what this. Let's concentrate on this. Forget autonomous and coercive, because the state in Europe and elsewhere deprives the Jewish kehila of autonomous and coercive powers. What about Jewish community? Does that mean anything to us? Is that a, a key value? Well, it's one of the four values that defined traditional Judaism for thousands of years, literally. Um, does the, can this stand alone? If you don't have this, and you don't have this and this, particularly if you don't have this, if you don't have fundamentalism, is community a value in and of itself independent of anything else? That's the big, if you want to strip it down to its essentials and do away with all the fluff, that's the big debate over the last 200 years. Down to today, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, does the lack of consensus on fundamentalism uh, preclude a common community? There are two sides of the argument. Um, some will say that, listen, we don't have to agree with everything, you know, it, it's a shame, but uh, the Jews are certainly a community of fate. To put it in, in, in modern terms, they say Hitler doesn't care what kind of Jew you are, you know, you've heard that argument before. Uh, and uh, community is a very, very powerful and important uh, component of, of Jewishness and Judaism. Um, and even though it's not exactly what it once was because it used to be grounded in this, uh, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it has an independent value and uh, we'll disagree over this and tomorrow we'll disagree over something else, uh, but the fact that we disagree doesn't matter because we're a family. Um, raise your hand if you're, I want to see how many liars there are. Raise your hand if you're a member of a family that's never had strong disagreements among its members. <laughs> but, but but it's a family. That's the way of looking at it, right? In other words, the community represents the notion that the Jews are, are a family, and um, the Reform and conservative Jews in the 19th century argue very passionately uh, that, look, there's always been a range of types in any Jewish community. And it's, in, in some sense it's true. Classically speaking, the notion of the kehillah, the Jewish community, has always meant, listen closely, I want to tell you, that is not one type of Jew, but every Jewish community represents from here to here. Uh, the, the saints and the sinners, right? The priests and the prostitutes, literally. And, 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 if you, and I'm not kidding. And this is a Talmudic concept. 
and, and other concepts, you've all heard the famous metaphor of the lul of the esterg, the hadas and the the good Jews and the bad Jews, but they're all supposed to be together. We've all heard these tropes, and it's in the Chazal. Similarly, you've all heard the famous, and it's from the Chazal, it's, uh, you've all heard the famous um, uh, metaphor of the spices of the Ketoros. Uh, these are ancient ideas. Uh, the Ketoros is something we're going to be reading in the Torah about next uh, week or two. And uh, what is that all about? You mix all the spices that are going to be and you bring it into next to the Holy of Holies. So it's a key notion that there's always been a range of types in the Jewish community, not all of one type. And so the fact that now we uh, don't agree on the fundamentals, so what? And the uh, other side of the coin was a no, absolutely not. Uh, everything you talked about before was only grounded in this. Not as if we all agree on the definition of Judaism, at least believing in God and the Torah, then you could say like this, some are more observant, some are less observant, some feel this way about it, some feel that way about it, but we're talking about the same kind of business, and then we're not checking everybody's uh, titches over here to see what's going on. We're not examining if everyone's a Shomer Shabbos. That's a different story. We don't have to worry about that. That's always been that way among the Jews. But they agree with the definition of Jewish is, and if you now assert, as under the pressures of modernity that I spoke about a couple of years ago, people do assert, in fact, increasing and, and majority numbers of Jews do assert that uh, uh, fundamentalism is not viable anymore and therefore nomianism e e is not either. So uh, then to say that there's something called community in the absence of belief in God is ridiculous because you're not Jews. You're Jewish biologically, you're Jewish halachically because you have a Jewish mother, but what you're saying is not Jewish and we can't have anything to do with you. Um, in other words, that's simply intellectual honesty. And to say anything else, would be a lie, and why should we live a lie? The famous exponent of this is, of course, Sans Ray Flourish. I mean, he's the spokesman who articulates this model. If you agree with the fundamentalism, you just say that you have issues with it, um, but you agree that that's the definition of Judaism, hear what I'm saying? If you say yourself, I may believe, I may not believe, but I believe that that's what Judaism is, if you say, I believe everybody should show Shabbos, at least theoretically, what I do is a different story, it's my business, then he's got no problem with that whatsoever. But if you say Judaism is redefined as the Reformed Jews do in the 19th century of the movement, and the conservative Jews also, and they say, as a Judaism which in principle uh, rejects fundamentalism, I repeat, in principle rejects fundamentalism, then we have nothing to talk about. Now, uh, what should I tell you? The, the, uh, this becomes a very definition of orthodox Judaism, which is a term that you hear for the first time in the 19th century, the rejection of others. That's, that's what it is, whether we like it or not. I mean, that becomes the core definition. But, but how stoutly do you assert this position? It's very famous that uh, Sam Sarifah Hirsch had a big fight in the 1870s with another very big rabbi in, in, in Germany, Würzburger Rabbi, I couldn't find a picture of him, or uh, Bamberger, who was a very famous Gadol in Germany, big rabbi, and, uh, and, and it was precisely over the question of community. That's what the fight was about. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard about it, but uh, the community in Frankfurt, where Hirsch was a rabbi, they uh, said that uh, even though we're reform, but we understand that Orthodox will have their own special needs and concerns, and we're willing to accommodate them in a variety of ways. You say, within the, we will budget for them and we will respect their uh, position, uh, even though others of us will not subscribe to the fundamentalism. And uh, the uh, Rabbi Bamberger, the Wurzburger Rabbi said, yes, that's enough. It's not ideal, but that's enough. Uh, in that case, the Jews can keep a common cemetery. Uh, the Jews can keep a common uh, institution, like we would say today, the JCC or something like that. Uh, obviously, in areas of religion, there will be the strongest uh, disagreements. But outside of the area of religion in a certain Jewish communal other aspects, uh, can we stay in, in the same community? And Hirsch said, this is terrible, and uh, what you're saying is totally wrong, and they had at each other for a year in a very famous uh, volume of correspondence view. If you read, I think, the sixth volume, if I'm not mistaken, of the collected works of Samson for Hirsch, it's all the arguments very eloquently and very bitterly stated between the two protagonists. Both of them were very famous Orthodox rabbis, the leading Orthodox rabbis in Germany in the middle 1800s. Both of them were very big people, of course, who strongly disagreed on this kind of issue, and they're really, at the end of the day, strongly disagreeing over what? They're strongly disagreeing of the valence of community and fundamentalism. You know, do, does one preclude the other, or is one conceivable without the other? So it's not a simple matter at all. These 
fight and, and the special, special bitterness that they engendered took place, I want to point this out, in the context of religious controversies. Meaning, it wasn't uh, that they're saying every Jew has to keep Shabbos, because you know, that's never going to happen, and that was never a criterion for inclusion in the, in the community. There was not a fight over whether or not people individually believe in fundamentalism, because there never was like that either. Uh, the question was how you define the Jewish religion. Uh, do you all at least admit that the Jewish religion is grounded in certain basic beliefs in God and the Torah? Or do you argue that there's another definition of Judaism and that's the special uh, bitterness it engendered? Because those who were what we call today Orthodox, very angry at what they call the unilateral redefinition of Judaism along other uh, lines and who gave you the right to do that and what gives you the right to expect or demand that we should go and join the same communion with us just because you decided to change the rules in the middle of the game. There's your fight. Now, what about secular Judaism, which does not really pop up in an organized fashion, let's say in Germany or places like that. That's something totally different. Pay close attention to this. The secular Jew says, you want to say that Judaism is a fundamentalist religion? Fine, I just have nothing to do with that. Okay, then we don't have any arguments. Then you simply say that you, under uh, the arguments of modernity, uh, don't believe in God or something. But you concede that the religion is one in which it does. You see where I'm going with this? You're not arguing for a different definition of Jewish religion. You're simply saying, I don't believe in religion. <laughs> I've moved past that in my life. So I'm willing to concede to you guys the religion if that's where you guys want to be. If you want to define the religion, do your thing. I think it's a, a Baba Misa. I think that you're dealing with myths. Uh, if that's what turns you on, go ahead. This is different than people who are arguing over the definition of the religion. Now, there is no significant uh, organized secular Judaism outside of Eastern Europe. Uh, there are many, many Jews in Germany and, and, and France and, and America and places, as we know down till today, who simply secularize. In other words, they check out of religion because of what they learn in school, <laughs> because of what science and, and modernity teaches. And, uh, and that's a, a majority phenomenon. But they don't organize themselves into something called a movement for secular Judaism or anything like that. They simply, on an individual basis, opt out. In Eastern Europe, it would be different. But in Western Europe, it's there. Um, under the impact of secularism, as I just said before, is a different dynamics. They're not disputing the nature of religion. They just don't believe. Now let's move ahead to the late 19th century, the emergence of Zionism. Uh, which is the modern embodiment of the communitarian idea. That's what Zionism was all about. You want to declare the Jewish people to be a one people? You want to say that even though in different countries they're all part of the same group? And you even, if you're a political Zionist, want to move them to physically make their own state and have their own country. So Zionism is not as such talking about religion, it's talking about peoplehood, a community. It's not about fundamentalism and nomianism, obviously. It's not into cultural insularity, because that's not what it's into. But it is into uh, community. I would even go so far as to saying it's into restoring a coercive community, although Herzl would have been offended by using those words. But that's what it's about, because a state is a, com a coercive community. Baltimore City is a coercive community. A club isn't, right? The, the city, the state, the federal, they can kill you, <laughs> to put it in blunt terms. They have the right to do it. If you don't listen to the laws, there are sanctions. That's, uh, we hope, the problem with Baltimore is they don't, <laughs> they don't <laughs> demonstrate sufficient vigor in, in enforcing the laws. But we understand that's a, you get what I'm saying? When it's all over, we're talking about a coercive community. So Zionism was into restoring all of that. Now, the charisma of Herzl, right, and the World Zionist Organization the charisma lay precisely in its claim to assert the reality of community of the Jewish people. Here you are in 1895, 1897, 1900, and for the first time, you have someone who's organizing a movement and getting some kind of attraction, some kind of a traction, for the idea that even though you live in America and I live in Russia and he lives in Germany and she's in Italy, it's all one thing. So there's a worldwide Jewish community. That was, in fact, the magic of the Zionist Congresses, as reflected in these kind of postcards that they used to give out. Here's Herzl, and here's all the other guys 
in their uh, you know, tails. And, but the point is, this is from Russia, this is from Germany, this is from France, this is from North Africa, this is from America. And people at that time look at the postcard and say, wow, uh, there's Klal Yisrael, as we say over there. The guy pulled it off. Now, if you want to be cynical and you want to be exact about it, nobody elected him, and nobody elected these guys, and they're self-declared, and it's a, you know, it's a smoke and mirrors. That's not the point, though. They got the magic, and they got the charisma at some level. Eventually, as you all know, they got a state of Israel, didn't they? It's a story, but it happened. So they pulled it off, and they were able to make it a, a cogent and accepted idea that there's something called the Jewish people. It's quite remarkable. The Jewish people. Uh, Herzl and eventually all the secular Zionists, as I tried to explain last week, uh, they want the Mizrahi in the tent. They want the religious Zionists to be part of the Zionist movement very, very much. Now, they want a tame Mizrahi, but they want him in the tent. Understand well, the Mizrahi movement, perhaps not in the beginning, under Rabbi Rhinus, but eventually will define itself as advocating a theocracy, which is what they do till today. Okay? Religious Zionist means that you're advocating within the confines, within the context of the Zionist movement for what? You want a religious state. Here we go to a religious state means autonomous coercive community. Get it? That's what they self-define as. Um, Rabbi Herzog, who later became the chief rabbi of Israel, who had three PhDs, a highly educated person, uh, he has uh, a truka, a, a constitution he proposed for Israel, it's a total theocracy. And he even says over there, it's a, I have his three very interesting form. And uh, he even says over there, anybody got a problem with, 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 with a theocracy? Saudi Arabia can do it, we can do it too. All right? This is what he writes. And I'll repeat again, not only was a tremendous uh, Talmud Chalk, as I'm sure many know, but he had uh, multiple degrees from European universities. He was a highly educated person. But this is how he's defining his idea of what the Jewish state should be. And he's a Zionist. He's a member of the, uh, of the Mizrahi and, and, and working within the context of the Zionist movement. Uh, but the fact that they are participating in the Zionist movement, which includes people like Herzl and everyone else, means that in spite of all that, they are... Uh, accepting the supreme importance of community, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the Zionist movement. The, the, the movement outside of Mizrahi is run by secular people. In other words, Chaim Weizmann, Theodor Herzl, uh, you know, Shishkin, all these guys are atheists. Uh, they'll, they'll tell you they are. I mean, it's not a, 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 a barb or something like that. That's what they are. They're European, modern individuals who are westernized. But nevertheless, they're privileging community as the core element, the core definition of Judaism, and the Mizrahi is part of that. So you can advocate for a theocracy, this one can advocate for a secular state, and the other one can do, and we can disagree on those kind of things, but still agree that we all want to be part of a community eventually of a state. On the other hand, the Agoda, which will be formed in 1912, will be formed uh, to represent the other view, the Hershey view, shall we say? That community does not trump fundamentalism. They want actually to be an alternative uh, to the Zionist movement. The, the Agudas Israel was founded in 1912 with the specific intention of being an alternative to the rising Zionist movement, which they saw as carrying off, uh, as in their opinion, all the masses. And they wanted to say, you can have a world organization just like they do, and we have uh, world conventions with delegates from religious people all over the world in the same way, called a Knesset instead of a Congress on manner. And, uh, you know, we have all the trappings of the movement, but we will be a movement that's Torah true, as they say. And we're going to put community in its right place after the fundamentalism. If you're the right kind of Jew, or at least you agree that the definition of Judaism has to be fundamentalism and nomianism, then you can be part of our community and uh, we're otherwise, and, and if you don't, we will do our best to enlighten you. <laughs> okay, that's that's where they're coming from. Now uh, there were internal uh, battles uh, from day one over how far to go over this. Uh, him versus him, Rabbi Breuer from Frankfurt versus Rabbi Chaim Brisker. He's the face of the Agudas uh, Yisrael uh, of Germany. Uh, Rabbi Chaim Brisker was the, was the most uh, leading, uh, famous Lithuanian rabbi uh, period <laughs> of that time. Hundred years of Rabbi Chaim Salvechik. Um, at the first Zionist, uh, at the first Agoda uh, uh, convention, a gathering in 1912, it's uh, very well known that uh, Rabbi Breuer 
who is uh, the son-in-law of Hirsch, and to be perfectly honest, he's more extreme in the in the exclusionary idea than, than Hirsch was. Uh, he gives a press conference in which he says that the Agudas Yisrael is going to be based on the idea uh, that wh wherever there are Jewish communities, uh, they should split into two, and the Orthodox should make their own. Austrit, like they had in Germany. And, uh, and he immediately said like this, he said in a letter to the press, I have nothing to do with that. Right? I don't agree with that. Uh, now, he was not irreligious, <laughs> less religious than him. Uh, but, but they're defining, so, so here you have two super religious people, and they're defining a very interesting uh, different points on these interesting principles, if you think about it in that kind of way. These internal battles were waging in Agoda from 1914 down to 1939. In the uh, Gola, the leading exponents of the, of the uh, Hersheyan position will be Rukhana Wasserman and uh, Ron Cutler, uh, who will uh, be very uh, passionate and advocating the position have nothing to do uh, with, with, with the Zionists whatsoever. And uh, Rebbe Chanum Asman said on many occasions, Rebbe Cutler also, you'll see if they ever set up a state of Israel, first thing they'll do is institute a persecution of the front. It'll be like the Absexia, like, like, like the communist Jews under Stalin's Russia, they'll liquidate everybody and put them in concentration camps. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's what he said on many occasions. Uh, on the other hand, this is uh, the Reisharov. He's the grandfather of Nat Lewin. Okay? He was one of the big rabbis in, 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 in Poland, obviously, Ryan Levin, and he uh, was uh, in, in the Polish Senate. Okay? Uh, you don't need me to tell you, he was Hasidic. And, and, uh, and yet he, he, he always articulated the other position, which is, I don't know if I'm a Zionist exactly, but the Jews have to hang together. And we, uh, the truth of the matter is, we could use a state in Palestine, a pronto. Uh, I would want it to be my kind of state, you know, we can argue over that. But nevertheless, uh, we do want it, and uh, it gets even more interesting. Uh, look at him, that's Ramosha Blau. Let's go to the next picture. Uh, that's Ramosha Blau, that's Amram Blau, the Tura Karta Aguda. Two brothers, grew up the same family in St. Jerusalem, totally ideologically opposite on the very question of whether or not an ultra-Orthodox Jew, a Haredi Jew, is, should, should have any connection whatsoever uh, with the Zionists. He, as the head of the Agoda, and again, you can see, he's, not, he's a pretty religious guy. He says, uh, Ramosha Blau is, uh, is the face of Agoda Sisro in, uh, in, in, in Palestine until his death in 1946. And uh, he uh, is the one who says like this, we have to be pragmatic about him, we have to work with him, I don't like what's happening, but we have to make the best of the situation. And Ramosha Blau, many of us remember, until his death, was heading the Torah Karta, who said, I'd rather have Arafat here. I'd rather have King, King uh, what do you call it? Uh, what was it? Abdullah and then Hussein. And uh, there literally is nothing worse uh, than Israel and the Zionism and the things it represents. So that's his position, which he held down uh, very passionately to the end of his life. So you see, families are split over this. Sometimes the elite families are split over this. And the split family on ideological issues is a key a feature, I would say, of 20th century Jewry. Again, raise your hand if nobody in your family, <laughs> you know, is, is different than you are religiously or otherwise. You have any cousins or anything like that? Uh, good, we don't have any liars. So the, um, uh, so the Agudas Yisrael, as it unfolds, I want you to understand this, in 1920s, it tries to get off, off the ground, uh, does not recognize in Palestine, in the 1920s and 30s, and 40s, the Yeshuv and its institutions, uh, the fact that there's a Knesset, and there's a state within the state that we've spoken about before, and that the uh, Zionists are setting up a whole set of uh, networks. The Agoda completely says we, like Sam Bush, we do not recognize this, we're going to make our own JCC, so to speak, we're going to make our own everything, or we won't have anything at all, but they're weak, they're small in number, the Zionists control, among other things, the immigration, uh, they're not going to let too many people like this, and why would they? And so the result is numerically, and otherwise, excuse me, the Agoda uh, movement in, in, in Palestine is going to be very weak, and they're, they're going to be too uh, afraid, physically, to be too blatant about their anti zionism because the neighbors will beat them up, or something like that. Uh, meanwhile, as we all know, uh, momentous events are taking place in Eastern Europe. I'm talking about going back to the late 1800s now, and early 1900s. What you find in Eastern Europe as a completely separate development that was happening in Western and Central Europe is the rise of militantly anti-religious trends. I'm talking about the left wing, Haskalah, and eventually uh, socialism, Bundism, and cultural Zionism and assimilationism. Uh, Moshe Leib Lillianblum is the face 
of uh, the anti-fundamentalist uh, um, uh, position in Lithuania <laughs> in the 1870s, 1880s. I mean, he's the man who writes all the books attacking the Shulchan Aruch and the rabbis and all this sort of thing. Um, Chana Am will emerge as, of course, the cultural, the iconic face of cultural Zionism. These are movements that define themselves as being in principle opposed to fundamentalism. I mean, they want to destroy it because they, they consider it not only wrong, but the evil. Okay? It's, it's doing bad things uh, to the people. It represents a lie, and it should be, like Voltaire said, Echo Saint Femme. It has to be crushed. Uh, the socialism and the Bundism, obviously, being Marxist movements of one sort or another, are going to be dedicated to the militant and principled opposition to any kind of religion whatsoever. And there in the Jewish neighbors that are working on the Jewish religion. These, these are trends which, uh, whose members include uh, the rich and the powerful and the strong. So you can't suppress them. So if you live in Vilna or Kovna or Warsaw or those kind of places in Eastern Europe, you can rant and rage at what these new trends are going, but you can't touch them because they're wealthy. So they include people who are wealthy. They're well-connected. They're, as I say, physically strong. You're not going to go after the Bundes. These are stevedores. They'll break your skull, you know. And, uh, and, and that's what it is. So in other words, uh, you just have to eat it. You just have to get used to the new situation, that there's no uh, unity uh, of any kind on questions of fundamentalism, nomism, and all the other stuff, okay? And there's nothing you can do about it. Um, on the other hand, the broad public in Eastern Europe, the broad public does not want a radical physical destruction of the religious. They just want their decadence. Now, a radical physical destruction of the religious will come under Lenin and Stalin and Soviet Union. That is what will happen, they'll shoot them. But before that, and outside of Russia, if you're talking about those areas not subject to communist control, in the 1890s and 1900s and, you know, Poland and Lithuania and Latvia and places like that, of which there are millions and millions of Jews, you find a funny situation arising in which, in one community after another, there's no community that's an exception to this, I don't think. Uh, some are now just moving to assimilationism. Uh, some are becoming cultural Zionists and setting up schools to perpetuate it. Uh, some are moving, obviously, to socialism and Bundism. And, uh, you know, and the Haskalah is already dead, but uh, it's morphing into cultural Zionism. And uh, it's happening all over the place. Like I said before, every family has brothers and sisters and cousins that split over this. So do you have weddings? Do you have bar mitzvahs? Do people get together for funerals? You, perhaps some of you have seen. Or now that I'm telling you, you may, you may want to look at a very fascinating phenomenon, you can see it in the Holocaust Museum, for example, go to photographs of 100 years ago, literally, from Eastern Europe. And, you know, family pictures, the kind of things that they keep in Yad Vashem and places like that. But you can Google it as well. And what will you see time and time again? Uh, here's a family picture, and some of them are super religious looking, and some of them are the opposite. And then it says Lithuania in 1922, or Warsaw in 1931, or something like that. And you understand exactly what's going on. And one picture over there will tell you a thousand words. And this is very, uh, you know, pop, common and, and, and so forth. Uh, there's a lot of nostalgia on the part of the not religious. For the religious, there's a lot of, uh, I don't know what the right word is, sympathy on the part of religious for their relatives. They're not religious. You can't simply tell people, hey, just split up, and one should have nothing to do with the other, and so forth. That may work in America, maybe. It didn't work in Eastern Europe, and that's not the way they ran it. In addition to which, the anti-Semitic Eastern European environment, the toxic anti-Semitic Eastern European environment, plus the fact that there are no uh, other religious groups like Reform Judaism, etc., in Eastern Europe, right? You just have secular, sometimes radically secular uh, groups that oppose the fundamentalism but don't try to redefine the Jewish religion. They say, you guys can handle the Jewish religion. In fact, religion is such a stupid thing that only a few old people like you would even be interested in it. The rest of us are moving past that. But therefore, they're not telling anybody how to change the synagogue. That ends up engendering a consensus in Eastern Europe among millions of Jews concerning uh, communal solidarity. It's kind of funny. Uh, neither side wants to uh, tamper with this, and neither side wants to push the envelope. So if you go, again, to any town in Lithuania or Poland or those places, Latvia, and certainly by the time the First World War and afterwards comes around, you'll see there's all kinds of different people in the town. And listen to what I'm telling you. There'll be elections in every place for Kehillahs and 
there will be a vote and there'll be uh, the elections for the Jewish community leadership will be contested too. It'll be Zionist parties and Mizrahi parties and Agoda parties and this and that and the other and the good old Jewish style of having, you know, a thousand, it's like a Republican uh, nomination, you know, and the, re the result will be that there'll be a lot of a screaming and carrying one, but when the elections are over, even if one side gains the majority of 51%, they're not, they're hesitant. Uh, to liquidate, so to speak, the other side, to completely defund them or shred them because they feel they need that kind of uh, uh, irreducible, uh, you know, feeling of community because we're all hanging together and these anti-Semites out there will be the only ones who will gain uh, out of it. A classic example uh, comes, uh, you know, a, a really wonderful example comes from the famous or notorious, depending on how you look at it, uh, uh, Vilna uh, Rabbi election, 1924. I'm sure some people must know about this. Chaim Moser Grzynski was the leading rabbi in the world. I mean, in the world. He lived in Vilna. Uh, before in the early 1920s, for a variety of reasons, he never wanted the job as chief rabbi there as officially. They had a tradition, whatever there is, for, for, for certain reasons. So he's the biggest scholar to whom the whole world is sending questions and looking, you know, looking to from America, from Germany, from you, you name it. So he's Mr. Torah, as I'm sure many are aware. And now comes... The Polish government in 1923 passes a law that in every city there's going to be uh, a Jewish kahila subject to the following rules. In other words, it's going to be a privilege with certain powers. They rewrite the laws to make it part of the Polish political reality, Polish political system. So in other words, now it really counts. And in that situation, um, the followers, the Shiva guys, you might say, in Vilna say, okay, so we're putting up Chaim Moser to be the, uh, obviously, obviously, the candidate to uh, be the chief rabbi of uh, Vilna. He never won it, but now he wants it, so obviously it goes to him. There's no question it comes to quality, or you know, he deserves it. Uh, it's not even a question. And he doesn't get elected because the Zionists don't like him because he's anti-Zionist in the Aguda. The Mizrahi also doesn't like him because he's anti-Mizrahi, even though he's number two over here, of Hanach Agus, um, if they're Yeshiva guys, he's the Marcheshes, okay? One of the most famous Lamdisha Sfarim, as I can say. Uh, a very well-known, uh, uh, safer use for Chabors. Is that a Mizrahi in, 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 in Vilna? He's on the, on the base in Chaim Meiser. This is, this is the thing over there. And uh, they put up their own candidate, Rabbi Yitzhak Rubinstein, uh, I'm sure you never heard of, who was a very fine rabbi and a very activist and all the rest of it, but nobody ever claimed that he was in the league in terms of scholarship and St. Leonard Sir Chaim Meiser, and, and the other guy won. Rubinstein won. Uh, it was a bitter election because his followers were absolutely shocked that anyone would dare even to stand up as a candidate against him. It's a achil Hashem. It's a bizarre look about a Torah, as they said over there. It's just unbelievable that anyone have the chutzpah to do so. And then ten times as much when the other guy wins. Uh, just to give you an idea of the passions engendered over there, who was the uh, campaign manager over here? Chavetz Chaim. It's like 90 years old. I'm serious. He was like 85, 90 years old. He was so uh, roused up by this. He gets on a bus. Yeah, the bus, he drives into Vilna, and he t sets up a headquarters and starts publishing uh, a daily, um, what shall I say, campaign sheet in which he trashes like Achsen Plato of the other side. And the other guy said, I, guess, I thought you wrote the book on, the, on, on Lashon Hara. <laughs> and he says, if you read the book on Lashon Hara, you see that on people like you, it's a mitzvah to say Lashon Hara. <laughs> this, is, this is really true. It's really true. Right? This is so. And so the result is you have a, a Jewish, uh, you know, election over there and uh, a good time is had by all. And, and, and wait a minute. And he lost. Now listen to this. When he loses the election and the other guy gets in, his side, his followers are so mortified and so embittered. I mean, they really, really were shocked and, and, and embittered by this that the victors start to get scared. And the victors say like this. Maybe we went too far. Uh, we don't want to push the other side over the thing and do some kind of Hershingian thing or whatever. Um, and it wasn't just that. It's really, this is my point. Everybody felt there's a certain irreducible minimum that you have to concede to the other side. And to treat somebody kind of like a, a nothing is going too far. And what really happens in the end is that although the other guy won the election, they really concede in, in de facto terms He's in charge of the uh, religious stuff in the city. 
you know, primarily. The other guy uh, was the chief rabbi as far as making Polish speeches and, you know, political things, which he was very good at, and, uh, you know, bar mitzvahs and, and, and weddings and funerals. But, uh, you know, that, that's okay. But for the real, the real thing, who should run the base and all the rest of it, de facto, it wasn't done ever publicly, but everybody knew what happened. They said they leave it basically in his hands. And, and that's an example. I'm, I'm sharing it with you, not to tell you a story. I'm sharing it with you to show you this is the Eastern European mentality before the Second World War. You can only go so far. You see? You can't push it uh, too much in that uh, direction. So um, this bespeaks a, a world in which the culture is very non hershey in the Eastern Europe. They don't agree with that. They don't agree there should be two separate Jewish communities. They say there, there should be one but, and fight. No, I'm serious. Well, listen, uh, you can fight it out or you can get divorced. And then you don't fight anymore. And they say, we don't get divorced. You want to fight. Uh, that, that's what happens. It's a different sensibility. A modus vivendi, therefore, emerges in Eastern Europe. The seculars get control. They usually win more than 51% of the seats, the different Zionists and Bundes other parties over there. But they concede religious matters uh, to the religious group. You get it? Again, if you go to Vilna or places like this, uh, who runs the Kehillah? The Zionist groups. They get the majority of votes. So therefore, the money and who, how you spend the taxes and all that is in their hands. But they will set aside a budget for uh, you know, a couple of religious schools to run the synagogues, the based in, the cemetery, and all the religious stuff. And you guys handle that. The rabbis and the religious guys handle that. Uh, marriages and divorces and all that, uh, you guys handle all that. Uh, the real stuff we'll take care of. Okay? And uh, it's very interesting because we over you already see where I'm going. This is the culture of Ben-Gurion's youth. This is the kind of world he and all these other guys grew up in. It's not America. It's not Baltimore in 2012. They came out of a different cultural uh, universe. It's natural. What I'm describing is going to be taken as natural for an Eastern European Mapai type guy, because that's what they did with you know, my parents and my grandparents back in the old country when I left uh, uh, over for here. And, and that's going to account, ironically, for one of the greatest oxymorons that Israel will be a secular democratic state, which will nevertheless, down to the current day, enforce a coercive uh, religiosity. <laughs> right? It's funny. You know, the, it, it's the coer it, it, we're back to the coercive community in secular Medina Yisrael, but of course there's a huge difference. Back in Poland, Lithuania, if a Cohen wants to marry a divorcee, so if the Jewish guy won't marry him, you can get some kind of a, a Polish or civil sort of a, a marriage. Uh, in Israel, you won't even you won't have that option, so it'll end up being more coercive even than it was in um, in Eastern Europe. But here's the interesting thing. It's 60 years of this, and nobody's complaining. By that I mean, there are always people complaining ever since 1948, and we'll talk about a small group, but they don't get traction, because if the public felt this way, they would change the law. And so here you have uh, secular kibbutzniks and others who, uh, you know, like I said before, you fight, you kick and scream all the rest of it, but they say, the reform movement, the conservative movement, other movements have come into Israel in native Israeli uh, movements have arisen from time to time to try to change the law and introduce a civil marriage, civil divorce, break the orthodox monopoly. It hasn't gotten traction among the broad public. You know, they're, they're kind of like willing to put up with this and they figure that's part of the crazy world that constitutes the wonderful world of Judaism. Now, um, in 19, when you get now to the end of the Second World War uh, and the Holocaust was over, and everybody saw, as I've tried to delineate, that something's coming up. So, the, uh, uh, 1946, the, uh, have the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry that President Truman uh, sent over. And uh, here is uh, uh, Dr. Yitzhak Breuer, Dr. Breuer, and uh, Rai Blau. Uh, they testify in front of the uh, Anglo-American community, and they fump it. You know, they, they, what, do you, what do you want? And eh, this, that, and the other. They can't say they're in favor of a Jewish state. They can't say they're in favor of Zionism. They don't want to say that they're anti. And, you know, so they just, like I say, they uh, spin the wheels. In 1947, uh, it gets really serious because the UNSCOP, the United Nations, sends a um, commission to go to Palestine. They're going to decide actually it was a Jewish state. We talked about this in this series, right? Then it wasn't just a commission of inquiry. This is Tachlis, okay? And 
When that happens, Ben Gurion and all the others say to the Agoda, "Do not break ranks." <laughs> you know, uh, this is our one chance. We have to hammer on the point that all the Jews want a Jewish state. You know, this is it. Now, in the Agoda, there are plenty of people who will feel good. So there not be a Jewish state. I'm telling you, you know, there, there, there are people like that who feel like I'm blow. But the leadership is scared to take that position. You see, the leadership says we we cannot break ranks. Uh, you know, who knows what will happen to us. And so uh, we'll go along, but we want a price. Right? We want concessions and guarantees. And as a result, they negotiate uh, because the Zionists, desperate as they are to have as much unanimity as they can, scared to death that if the religious Jews delegitimate Zionism, it'll kill it in the eyes of the United Nations and the other people in the world. Because what, at the end of the day, as I mentioned last week, is the primary basis, or one of the primary basis, for the establishment of Israel. It's a religious claim. It wouldn't happen today, but it did happen in 1947. And part of it is the Holocaust, no question about that. Part of it is the religious side. The religious Jews say that setting up a Jewish state, a secular Jewish state, is against the Jewish religion. That would kill it. And so Ben-Gurion and the other Zionists, they say, oh, let's, let's work this out. What does it take? And they uh, have exchange of letters, which is called the status quo agreement. Okay. Here it is. I'll read it to you very uh, briefly because uh, it's not long. And this is a letter sent on June 19th, 47, by Ben-Gurion to the Aguda. Uh, and it says, the Jewish agency executive, that's the Zionist, has heard from his chairman your request to guarantee that marital affairs, meaning marriage and divorce, Shabbos, education, and kashras in the Jewish state, which we hope will arise in our day. As the chairman executive informed you, as has Ben-Gurion told you, neither the Jewish agency executive nor any other body in this country is authorized to determine the constitution of the Jewish state in the making in advance. Remember we said last week or two weeks ago, they're supposed to have a constitution, and that laid down the rules. Never happened, but they're supposed to have a constitution. That's what the United Nations and the participation and partition resolution uh, put in there, that the Jewish state and the Palestinian state, the Arab state, will both have constitutions which will guarantee religious freedom. Uh, the establishment of the state requires the approval of the United Nations, and this will not be possible unless the state guarantees freedom of conscience for all of its citizens and makes clear we have no intention of establishing a theocratic state. So Ben Gurion said, I guess, I'd like to accommodate you, United Nations. Yeah, now it goes, the Goyim. That's what he's saying. Uh, the Jewish state will also have non Jewish citizens, Christians and Muslims, and so forth, and full equal rights for all citizens in the absence, absence of coercion or discrimination in religious affairs or other matters must be guaranteed in advance. So let me make clear, we can't guarantee you no theocratic state. Right? That's not going to happen. We, are, we were pleased to hear that you understand that no body is authorized to determine state constitution retroactively, and the state will be free in certain instances to determine the constitution according to the will of the citizens. And yet at the same time, <laughs> the other shoe, the executive appreciates your demands and realizes they involve issues of concern not only to the members of the Agoda, and not only uh, to defenders of the Jewish faith, but to many people within the Zionist camp and outside party frameworks who understand fully your demand that the agency informs you of its positions on the issues you raise. So here we go, go to the bottom, and he says, here's what we're going to do. A, B, C, and D. A, the Sabbath. It is clear, this is all written in Hebrew, of course, it will be clear that the legal day of rest in the Jewish state will be Saturday, obviously permitting non-Jews like Christians and others to have their weekly holiday. So we can't promise you to shoot anybody's in Machal Shabbos, but Shabbos will be the official day off in the Jewish state, which happened. Um, Kashras, one should use all means required to ensure that every state kitchen intended for Jews will have kosher food. So we'll kosher the state for food. Okay? And that's officially the rule again till today. If it's the arm or the others, they may like it, they may not like it. Okay? But it's all kosher. This will actually be an interesting bone of contention when they set up the Israeli army in the War of Independence, especially in the, the later parts of the War of Independence, because um, then Israel is already a little more settled, the Arabs are on the run, and the future Tahal, as they call it, Tzvagan Ali Israel, is being formed. And what do you do for food? And the Mapam party, as we'll see later on, was in principle opposed to everything I've been talking about now. They represent that part of the Jewish uh, Zionist movement, which is uh, strongly and in principle opposed uh, to religion. And they're not trying to ram it down somebody's throat, but we don't want to be rammed down our throat. And the Mapam will say, um, how shall I put it? 
The Mapam will say, we want to have separate units. For those soldiers who want to keep kosher, that's this battalion. And for those soldiers who want to keep not kosher, they'll be in that battalion. And Ben-Gurion will say, no, we have to have one army with everybody's in the same thing, therefore we've got to kosher everything. And the Mapam will say, it's religious coercion. And Ben-Gurion will say very famously, these guys are not allowed to eat a ham sandwich. It's not against your religion to eat a kosher sandwich. <laughs> you know what I'm It's not violating a principle to eat a kosher sandwich. But, uh, and, and, and they will get it. You know, the army, as you know, is, is kosher. Marital affairs, which means marriage and divorce. All members of the executive recognize the serious nature of the problem and the great difficulties involved. And all bodies represented by the Jewish agency will do all that can be done to satisfy the needs of the religiously observant in this manner and to prevent a rift in the Jewish people. This is the big argument that worked in Eastern Europe and the big argument that will work with the state of Israel. If you're going to have two different types of Jews, this one can marry this one, that one can marry that, we'll split it into different peoples, and even people who are not religious will accept that argument in those days. They won't accept it today, but they accepted it in those days. And finally, education. Full autonomy of every stream of education will be guaranteed, um, and the government will, t will take no steps that adversely affect the religious awareness and religious conscience of any part of Israel, the state will supervise the and determine the minimum obligations. Hebrew language, history, science, and the like will supervise fulfillment of this minimum, but will accord full freedom to each stream to conduct education according to its conscience and to avoid any adverse effects on religious conscience. So it basically says that we're not going to touch the yeshivas or that sort of thing. Uh, that's the status quo. Those four issues. Shabbos, kashas, chinuch, education, and marriage and divorce. That's the... Uh, Heart, heart, heart of all this uh, sort of thing. Now, um, Shabbos and Kashrus is not so important to the Agoda. After all, they know nobody's going to go to Shabbos to their standard except them. And it's not uh, affecting them personally if someone else doesn't keep Shabbos or kosher. It's very important to the Mizrahi because the Mizrahi, as a Zionist movement, wants to religionize the state. They will be the ones who will be most active in passing theocratic laws that are still in the books today, not the Agoda. Uh, they will be the ones who will push, as soon as the state of Israel becomes a state, to have bylaws in local municipalities elsewhere, keeping the stores closed and punishing those people who open them, keeping the buses closed and punishing anyone who does them, at this kind of level, because to them, uh, this is what the state of Israel is all about, in their opinion. And they will use their political lobbying skills to get all these kind of laws uh, passed over there. Personal status, marriage and divorce is important to both groups, but again, mostly to Mizrahi, simply because the Agoda type guys aren't going to marry anybody outside their group anyway. You understand? That's a fact. Chinuch uh, is of supreme importance uh, to the Agoda group, because that's what they're all about. They want their institutions, they want their world that they can control, the yeshivas, the beisiachs, all the rest of it, and they get it. Uh, ben Gurion and company do not recognize the significance of their concessions as regarding Chinuch. They just don't see what you and I know after 60 years. They don't get it. Um, they will create, interestingly, uh, without meaning to, uh, a world within a world, a subculture, uh, totally funded by government money. Uh, they will do this in ways that you wouldn't imagine. For example, um, the government, uh, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but uh, under the uh, way the laws will unfold, there will be four different types of, uh, of school systems. And one of them will be the Agoda school system. And for example, it means that Beis Yaakov uh, will now get something it never had. It was dirt poor and struggling and starving beforehand. And they had a few. And now it's a government payroll. Just like the government funds all kind of regular uh, public school systems, they'll fund the Beis Yaakov one. Not as many as the others, but there aren't that many people that are interested in it. But in places like B'nai Brock in Jerusalem, where all the Haredim are, that's where they'll get government money. So you're a principal, you're a teacher, you get a government salary, and you get government benefits. The same ones that a public school teacher gets. All of a sudden, you invented Kolel, because you can have a wife, I'm serious about this, you can have a wife who's getting a salary even if you're learning. This never existed in Jewish history. Do you get public money to do that? This wasn't Ben Gurion's intention, but this is what happens. So there's no such thing as a large, the Kolel in Eastern Europe was small. Rabbi Rubin was a Kolel of five people. You understand? A special type, but five people. The idea of you have a mass system of tens of thousands of people literally is not possible without massive government funding. <clears throat> this is what you can call the base Yaakov revolution. The people whose significance is only beginning to be written about by historians, like Professor Friedman in Israel and others. Uh, it, 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 again, unintended consequences, but it does happen. Um, yeshivas, for the first time, we're going to get 
serious government money. It's never as much as they want. It's, no school ever gets as much as they want. I never heard of that. But the, the last time I ever heard of somebody turning down money was Moshe Rabbeinu back time in the Mishkan. Ever since then, they take it. The, uh, <laughs> is your experience different than mine? The, uh, w w wait a second. Um, so what will happen in Israel will happen in an unprecedented way because they have access to government funds. Don't we talk in America, isn't there always a battle raging about separation of church and state and getting money uh, for the day schools and this sort of thing? And some people say, oh, you shouldn't do it because separation of church and state, which I totally understand. Uh, and others say, listen, we're getting killed under tuition. If, if I asked everybody here, who's getting killed under tuition? Everybody raised their hand. True? Seriously. All, all kidding aside. And so uh, you see the difference over there. Um, for the first time, Haredi you know, education is government funded. Uh, ben Gurion's, as I mentioned last week, will end up, because of politics, hooking up with the front parties, with the Gurim Mizrahi, the Chazid Datit, because of political reasons. He wanted, in short, a, a pro Western foreign policy and a socialist domestic policy. Uh, the only people who would give him what he wanted was the religious party because they want the funding. They'll let him do whatever he wants. And so Ben-Gurion, the 15 years that he's in power between 1948 and 1963, will have basically a free hand to do what he wants, uh, broadly speaking anyway, in foreign policy and in domestic policy, uh, mainly because he's backed by these uh, religious parties, certainly by the Mizrahi, but the price is that he has to give them the money to fund their institutions. Uh, he thinks that the religious parties will not be a problem. He is, of course, wrong. He's wrong. They th he thinks they'll wither and die because the ideas they represent are so old-fashioned they'll only be able to, uh, you know, attract a t a, 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 an increasingly small, if I can use that expression, a smaller and smaller uh, constituency. Uh, he'll run the country the way he wants, and the religious will be like the kite, you know, they'll just go in the back. He's wrong. Religious matters will fardre him a cup and eventually bring down the government repeatedly. This is 1949, 1950, 51, and 52. If you know all the ins and outs of the Israeli politics, the Israeli government falls repeatedly, meaning he resigns and tries to form a new government uh, and get a better deal, and he never is able to get a better deal. Uh, and eventually it drives him to distraction, and he quits being prime minister in 1953. He goes for a year of vacation or a year of retirement. He said it's a, going to be permanent retirement in State Bokeh. Then the negative, this is why he did it. He said he can't stand all these constant meetings with the religious parties over this religious demand and that religious demand. He thought he's going to be in paradise running the foreign policy and running domestic policy, but it turns out he's always arguing with them with all these kinds of things. Um, no one gets it at the time. But a distinct cultural revolution takes place together with the founding of the state. That's what I'm showing you, an unexpected one. Uh, Ben-Gurion, as they say before, calculated this the last breath of the old culture. In reality, he's laid the foundations for a new one, for a new, a new subculture society growing, of fundamentalism, nominism, coercive autonomous co community, and cultural insularity, right, of an unprecedented scale. In other words, what we have in Israel today is a fundamentalism of an unprecedented scale, a nomianism of an unprecedented scale, certainly a cultural insularity, without question, of an unprecedented scale, and seems an autonomous course of community also. Right? It doesn't have exactly the typical government powers, but it works. <laughs> it's pretty darn coercive, and to remain able to go. Uh, remember, Israel self-defines as a social welfare state, as a socialist state. And so, uh, even if you're poor, the government pays for your bread, and they pay for your basic needs. Right? That's in Israel. Anybody old enough to remember how much a loaf of bread cost before they got rid of the uh, price controls, everything, like uh, years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago? It used to be two, three cents for a loaf. You remember that? And things like that. Uh, at that point, you could be learning uh, forever, and you'll never starve. You see what I'm saying? Kupat uh, Cholim. A social welfare state promises health care for each and every one of its citizens. They don't intend for it to be the ideal happy hunting ground for a cola, but that's what it is. Uh, you, you can laugh, but you, under, but you do understand what I mean. That was not their agenda, but that's what it turned out over there. Uh, Haredi education system, he said it'd be subject to government inspection. You know and I know that never happens. It certainly doesn't happen today. Uh, how, many, how much secular studies is there in Israel in the religious schools? That much, yeah. Now, um, 
Israel also self-defined as a political democracy. Political democracy means for the first time, Haredim will have political power. They didn't have political power in Poland and Russia and places like that. A tiny group, and the Jews are out of the, uh, kicked out of the political system for one reason or another, anti-Semitism or other reasons. They're out. Now in the state of Israel, there's as much voters as anyone else. Uh, they're empowered in the literal sense. Again, this wasn't a plan why they set up Israel, but this is what happened. So once you're empowered, if you learn how to play the system, you can play the system, and they certainly do. To my palm, that's why they're freaking out all during these years. They said Ben Gurion won't join us with the won't, won't, won't uh, admit us to the government, but he's admitting these ultra orthodox type of people over here, and uh, they're they're horrified. Uh, ben Gurion will appoint Rabbi Gurion to run the, the religious side of the army, in which case, he's, what they're saying is like this, the army is a secular institution, but as far as the religious goes, we're back to Eastern Europe. Let these guys handle it, right? And Rabbi Gordon does a very famous and successful job of bringing in Orthodox Judaism into the army for those that are interested in it. You know, obviously, most of the soldiers who serve in the army are not religious, but anyone who has an experience with Sahal will know Shabbos, you have uh, ceremonies, and everybody has a Seder, and Yom Kippur, and the food is kosher, and all this kind of stuff. And why do they put up with it? But they do. Uh, he will, but yeah. <laughs> this, this is, this, Howard noticed this. And I couldn't let it go. <laughs> I have absolutely no comment to make on that subject whatsoever. <laughs> Beg pardon? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> uh, now, uh, let's move to the next one. This is, this is the son of Jabotinsky. He had one son. He will, Jabotinsky, uh, junior like senior, very opposed to anything other than the separation of church and state very opposed to any kind of religious coercion. He will form uh, the League Against Kfiadatit, against religious coercion in 1950, and they will want to fight again. No traction. You've never heard of him. That's my point. Right? And he eventually became a mathematician, and he worked in Ethiopia. He said, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. Now, you'd think it would. Uh, they're already uh, having what we call, you'll see him in, you know, uh, coercion incidents and things like this. He doesn't get any, any, any traction. It turns out, as I told you before, when the state of Israel is formed, even the broad uh, po secular public is willing to put up with a certain amount of coercion. This is remarkable, and it's unforeseen. But it does happen. Uh, the seculars, unlike him, simply don't become politically self-aware. They don't self-define as a separate party. Um, they complain about it, uh, but they, it, it ends up being in newspaper columns, like this one in Haaretz this past week, where a guy, maybe you, you saw this, a guy has a whole article saying Israel humanists should declare themselves a religious majority. They're as hated as much as... Eh. But, you know, it's one of those things where they say, yeah, all right, it's a bunch of nuts, you know? And, and they don't get traction. You understand? It's a stringer. You know, they, they don't get any traction. A Chaim Weitzman had warned about this because Chaim Weitzman was a, a smart fellow who was a disciple of a Chana Am, and therefore uh, was, had very strong feelings on these kinds of subjects. And he wrote his book, Trial and Error. Uh, in 1949, after Israel became a state, he became the first president of Israel. And his last chapter is called The Challenge. And it's a brand new state. He's writing about all its possibilities, but he's scared to death. Many questions, he writes, will emerge in the formative stages of the state with regard to religion. There are powerful religious communities in Palestine which now under a democratic regime will rightly demand to assert themselves. I think it is our duty to make it clear to them from the very beginning that whereas the state will treat them with respect, religious feeling communities cannot be put back, cannot put the clock back by making religion the cardinal principle in the conduct of the state. Religion should be relegated to the synagogue and the homes of those who want it. Uh, it should occupy a special position in the state, but it should not control the ministries of the state. Ha ha. Right? I have never feared, he says, uh, really religious people. Now you have to understand, this is one of the main fighters against religious Judaism in Eastern Europe uh, in, 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 in the uh, Achan Ham era. Uh, but he said, I've never feared really religious people. The genuine type has never been politically aggressive. On the contrary, he seeks no power, modest and retiring. Modesty was a great feature in the lives of our saintly rabbis and sages in the olden times. Let them all go off into the corner, nice oblivion. 
Uh, it is the new secularized type of rabbi, representing some, resembling somewhat a member of a clerical party in Germany, France, or Belgium who's the menace, and will make a heavy bid for power by parading his religious convictions. It's useless to point out to such people that they transgress the principle in the Torah, do not make it a spade with which to dig. He's probably uh, the, the Dvar Torahs did others. Uh, th there will be a great struggle. I foresee something which will be rep re reminiscent of the Kulturkampf in Germany, the culture struggle. Uh, but we must be firm if we are to survive. We must have a clear mind, line of demarcation between re legitimate religious aspirations and the duty of the state towards preserving such, on the one hand, and the other hand, the lust for power, which is exhibited by the pseudo-religious groups. Uh, today, 60-some years after this day, he, 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 it's lost. <laughs> you know, in other words, he, he seems like a weirdo. Um, but, you know, he wasn't a dummy. He saw it. The... Uh, the religious, therefore, starting in 48, start to feel their oats. And many use violence. Uh, what you and I are familiar with, the Beit Shemesh spitting, I can use that term, you know what I mean? Actually starts in Mea Sharm and Gula in 1940-49, if you want to get down to it. There were big fights, for example, over the Edison movie theaters. Anybody remember that? In uh, Gula, which now, now became a, uh, recently is now a hater. But uh, therein lies a tale. But uh, already up to 48, uh, Jerusalem was the United City before the uh, war. Uh, all the Arabs and people, I guess, all go Friday night to the big movie theater right in the heart of Gaula, which is next door to Mea Sharm, as you all know. Starting in 48, there are no Arabs nor anything else. Uh, if, this, if the movie starts too early or, you know, on Saturday night or late, uh, fist fights, violence, things like this. Then the police come in, they crack heads. It's a whole big uh, business. But then the uh, government is afraid of cracking down too hard because of this, right? They're afraid of pictures like this, which already started in 1949 with the Satmar in New York City, which Ben Gurion and the other guys freak out about majorly because Israel's so delicate they can't afford any bad publicity as they see it over here. And this is not playing fair. You're supposed to only fight within the community. You're not supposed to go outside. And these guys are not part of the Agoto consensus or anything like this. And they'll do whatever they feel like, and there's nothing you can do to them. Um, so Beit Shemesh spinning starts with the new state. Uh, the turf wars begin over here. Um, the existence of the Naturi Karta, interestingly, pushes Ben-Gurion to be nice to the Aguda because he doesn't want them to join the Naturi Karta, and he's the big beneficiary of it. This is Ishmael Levin, who is the leader of the Aguda in the Knesset, who was a minister in Ben-Gurion's government, a minister of, of social welfare for four years, uh, has a very good personal relationship with Ben-Gurion, but obviously is a different type of person once altogether, you know, need me, me to tell you. And uh, he's able to secure many concessions uh, for the Haredi public over, the, uh, 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 over, over these uh, uh, years. Um, on the other hand, other Haredi leaders, Gedolim, more statesmanlike, oppose violence because they take the long view. And the long view is, don't do anything, it'll fall in our hands eventually anyway. That would be the, the Chazanish, the Pan of Yisharav, the Kleisenberg Rebbe, all famous for building institutions, staying out of violence, and just concentrate on increasing your numbers, increasing your institutions which, in 60 years later, has kind of worked. Right? You understand? That, that's exactly who they represented. He did it in a Hasidic way, he did it in a Lithuan Shishi way, he did it in the broad uh, Haredi way, but that's what they stand for. They're not in favor of fighting at movie theaters. Uh, that's, not where the, that's not where the battle is. The battle's elsewhere. You see? Um, the Mizrahi, as I say before, during these years, pushes all kind of bylaws in, in just about every municipality except for Haifa and gets all kinds of theocratic uh, laws passed. In short, the fears that the Ashkenazi Haredi Jews will be de-religionized by the state turn out to be totally mistaken, quite the contrary. So it's not what, he's, what, what he said. I'll repeat, if you're an Ashkenazi Jew and you land in Israel whenever you do, nobody's cutting your pay off at the, at the airport, if you're Ashkenazi. No, no, I'm serious. Here, uh, on the other hand, the Sephardic Yemenite Aliyah is a different story. Here you have the common racism of the religious and the non-religious parties. One of the early sad facts of Israel is there's a big Ashkenazic racism against the non-Ashkenazic Jews. You can deny it or not. Uh, and both sides view the new immigrants as objects. Uh, and therefore they'll fight over them. Uh, who gets to control them? It's very, very interesting. If you, wanna, if you read uh, Tom Seger's book, now he's not religious, quite the opposite, but he has a book, 1949, which he wrote in 1986. And uh, 49 is just what I'm talking about. And these are there's two chapters, very interesting. And remember, he's springing from his point of view, but very interesting over uh, the phenomena that I'm speaking about over here now. And he has a very fascinating passage.
from one of the leading Aguda um, Chabad Knesset, leaders of the Knesset, which was uh, Kalman Kahana, Rabbi Kalman Kahana, does anybody possibly remember him from Kibbutz Chabad Chaim? Uh, one of the signers of the Israeli Declaration of Independence. Okay, I'm telling you, people don't know. Rabbi Kahana, uh, not Mayor Kahana, Kalman Kahana. And he's a, ya he's a yaki and all this sort of thing. He's a very fine person. He later on was a big macher in what they call the Poli Aguda. And uh, he writes himself, looking back, because he's engaged in all these fights over controlling the Sephardic and the Yemenite immigrants. She so put him in religious schools, and they'll brainwash them that way, or put him in secular schools, they'll brainwash them the opposite way. Who gets the right to brainwash them? And he says, looking back, he made a significant statement. Listen to this. He says, I blame the Mapai system for trying to take away the Oriental immigrants, not only their religion, but their communal and cultural identity. However, in this matter, I blame us too. Uh, the religious education failed to appreciate the culture which these people brought from them from Yemen, Morocco, and Turkey, and we did them harm by imposing our own religious education on them. We put them in a good of schools, tried to my Ashkenazi Jews. There are Yemenite children who knew entire chapters of the Bible by heart, and I, a Hebrew teacher, taught them as if they didn't know any Hebrew because their accent different, differed from mine. And what did I teach them? The cat sat on the mat. I did them harm, and today I feel it was a disaster, not only to the immigrants, but to the whole country. And that's a short quote of what you can apply across the board, which is, nobody treated them with respect. They've already become a political football uh, over these years. Uh, but the sad fact is, that politics poisons everything because if they all go religious, they'll vote for the Mizrahi and the Aguda, and the Mapai will lose votes. Chas the government will go down. Uh, but other than the Tammany Hall need to garner votes, there's no really strong ideological uh, enthusiasm for secularizing the Eidot HaMizrach. It's all political, so that poisons it. That's why the Chazonish will tell Ben Gurion in his famous meeting in 1953, we represent a full boat and you represent an empty boat. Because by that time, the ideological winds have been taken out of the sails of secular Zionism. And the only reason they're forcing these immigrants when they get off the boat to cut the payers and go to a secular school, the rest of it, it's all about votes. So that cheapens the whole uh, enterprise. You, you, you poison the secularizing uh, kind of process. Huge political battles will rage in Israel's early years over education among the Edom and Mizrach. The Mapai will do their best to you de-religionize them, you'll have the Tehran children all over again, that whole business, indeed the cutting of the pace, indeed forcing children to eat uh, non-kosher, indeed forcing them into all kinds of environments that are very different than the one that'll be in there. There's a guy, Nachum Levin, who's appointed by Ben-Gurion to run the whole operation, and he brings the Sachnut mindset, the mindset of the Jewish agency, which is the right way, the not the wrong way, to Israelize everybody is by depriving them of their religion, and that becomes their bureaucratic mindset, down to the Ethiopian Jews, if you remember, which wasn't that long ago. Uh, they brought them in, the first thing they take their religion away, and they think they're doing them a favor. Golda Meir will say, we're doing you a favor. When you came to this country, she says to the Yemenite Jews, you didn't even know how to use a knife and a fork. And we taught you that, as, in, as, as if that's what it's all about. Uh, the, listen, Robin Chalol and Mepil, I mean, they, 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 they messed up a lot of people, I'm sorry to say. Uh, the Mizrahi leader, not the Agoda leader, in uh, the Knesset, W.C. Pincus, will repeatedly make speeches in 1949, 1551, saying that Israel becoming a Nazi state, this is his words, that the schools that the Mapai are setting are concentration camps, the kind of stuff that we get angry about when you see him today recently in the news in Meisharm is being used by the Mizrahi part of the Zionist party back in those years, gives you an idea of how bitter everything is. I'm done, more details will be next year. To conclude, well, I can't, you know, listen, to conclude, the Mapai et al. will be successful in the short run in keeping the Edot Mizrach from voting religious. They will get their votes by hook or crook. But it will breed a fierce resentment in the long run and certainly soured the Edot on socialist Zionism, uh, which is why the Sephardic Jews, broadly speaking, are the voters for Begin all during the years. This is their way of expressing a protest against what was done to them. Uh, as I said before, this is not done in the Western sense of a progressive, small, incremental approach, little by little. Uh, you move from the Renaissance to the Age of Reason to the Enlightenment to modernity, and little by little people change their opinions. This is shoved down your throat. When you shove down something in my throat, I don't like you for it. Okay? And in short, what have I described tonight? I've tried to. A compromise? A conflict? A confusion? I said, who won? Okay? Uh, this will uh, 